uh, you know, if you went into work every single day and it was similar to the day before, um, you'd probably not be as happy as you would if you've got certain challenges. Now, you don't want to every day go to the end of the line or at the edge and be ready to fall off, but that's part of the adrenaline of being an entrepreneur is that you, you kind of don't know what's going to happen next exactly. But Franklin Street Bakery has been, um, without a doubt, the most exciting business I've ever been involved with so far. And, you know, there's probably more to come, I hope, and I hope there's other things coming on, on the line for me to get involved with. But, and I think the reason is, is that it, it, it's pulled together so many different aspects of building a business. You know, the restaurant, the restaurant industry is a very tough business. Anybody here know anybody that's been involved with a restaurant? I mean, it, it's, it's probably got one of the highest failure rates anywhere. I mean, 70 plus percent of restaurants fail within the first year and certainly within the first five years of when they open. And the investment that you put into a restaurant is not just, you know, a nice looking menu and some tables and chairs. It's a lot of infrastructure. So you put a ton of capital into opening a restaurant. Well, and that's the world that I've known for now almost 30 years. Uh, but the bakery came on board and it was something that uh, I guess I would say is that if you're a true entrepreneur, uh, you never really know, you know, what your next gig is going to be. And uh, back in 1990, I certainly wouldn't have thought that we'd, you know, be 16 years into a business that is growing at a, a wonderful rate. Uh, we, we will have doubled our sales. Through next year, we will have doubled our sales from the time we moved into this building. That's why we have growth problems. Um, but they're good ones. But my point, if, if you really want to be an entrepreneur, uh, you've got to be ready to roll with a lot of things. You've got to be, you've got to have the gut for flexibility and you've got to have, you know, the ability to kind of, you know, shift on the fly, so to speak. Um, because, you know, now I'm, you know, the, the bakery is a, is a faster growing, more capital intense business than any restaurant that I've ever been involved with. Uh, like, like the presentation showed a little bit, uh, in the restaurant, if you need a new stove, well, it's, you know, twenty, thirty thousand dollars $30,000 with the hood system, et cetera. Any one piece of equipment on this is, you know, as much as a home. And we just put in two silos, for example, that hold 30,000 30, pounds of flour each that we'll fill twice a week. Uh, each one of those are over $200,000 a piece. And then if you get the, the double silo like that, then, of course, you can't, you know, put the, the flour into the normal mixer that you had before because you need that bigger, so then you need to automate that, and you gotta automate getting the finished dough over to uh, get it into the machine that forms it, et cetera, et cetera, you get the idea. Um, so if you don't have the stomach for those kinds of challenges, well then you go out and get a job. You know? But if you, if you do, uh, you, know, you look for the world that you create yourself, and um, I, I'm not real comfortable, I mean, honestly, I'm not real comfortable with how many times it kind of pointed that, you know, I did this, and then I did this, and then I did this. Um, success is completely, completely tied in with who you get involved with, and who your partners are, and who you like to work with, and who, who is competent that you work with. It is important that you hire the best talent around, but you know, you really do have to like the people you work with, particularly the closer they are to your, your investment and their investment. You don't have to be absolute buddies. Mark Haugen and I, uh, we try to figure as best we can to go to dinner once in a while with our wives if we can, and it doesn't work out. But you know, I, he and I trust each other completely on everything we do. So you don't have to be best buds, but from a business standpoint, you've got, you've got to have someone, first and foremost, that you completely trust. Then lots of cool things start to happen. And I'll tell you, I, I have been totally blessed and completely lucked out with the partners that I've had over these 30 years. And, you know, I, I, don't, know, I don't know if it's uh, uh, karma or roll the dice or whatever, but uh, I, I've got to say, I, I couldn't script this better. So, I, you know, as far as saying, you know, how did you do that? Well, you kind of, many times, you ended up in the right place at the right time and, and you know, on, on the same page with somebody else, and you realize that, hey, you know what, I, I like who this person is, uh, to me, that's the first thing. You know, who is this person really, and what kind of talent do they have, and what do they they think of you as well? And then you can start to do things. And that's really not only at the partner level; that's at every level on down. You know, if you if we're looking for a great mixer, someone who can mix dough for us, 
Uh, we can train them. You can train people's skills, but you really have to feel: Are they, you know, do they fit? Are they are they the type of character and individual you want with the organization? So it's not just at the top, but boy, it's a heck of a lot better when you know your partners at the top are on the same page with you and you can trust each other. Um, I think there's plenty of case studies to where you know volumes of where that hasn't worked out very well for some people, um, and companies have come down because. You know, that wasn't there. Um, finally, I guess I would like to uh, uh, mention about Franklin Street Bakery before we open up the questions, is that it, um, has anybody been there at 11th and Franklin? It's not too far from here, actually. Yeah, you guys. <laughs> you got the GQ look, too. Um, I think we have pictures somewhere, don't we? You can take some pictures. Um, you don't have to wear the hairnets when you come in, only if you think you want to go back and you know work on making some stuff. Uh, it's that, it's just... It, the, 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 um, the business is and the growth is wholesale. Um, the sexy side of growth of a bakery is retail because you got cool, cool cakes and little of this and that, whatever, and you know, boutiqueness and smallness and create, creative little pieces is always, you know, is, is sexier. Garners more press, garners more visibility, kind of looks cooler, etc. Well, we fortunately have the talent on that little 5% of retail business uh, to put out some really cool stuff that we don't necessarily sell wholesale. But it's really meant to be kind of a statement uh, of a level of quality that we aspire to. I will add, you know, part of the problem with the caribou, there was a lawsuit and went through everything, et cetera, and I'm happy to talk to you over a Starbucks to talk about the caribou situation. <laughs> uh, did that come out right? Um, but it really was, part, part of it was the contract and the writing and everything else and the details and that, but it really was we were being asked to do something of less quality because they, they were looking at a lesser price than what we had you know, agreed to do. And it was quality as much as it was price at that time saying, you know, no, I, no we won't. We won't make something that we don't feel totally proud in making. And that's how we continue to build the wholesale business as well, is that, yeah, some of our products are more expensive. I, has anyone actually heard of Goodfellas? It, it, it was a fine dining restaurant. Well, it was around for 19 years and it was at the top of the heap. In the early years, I honestly would apologize on occasion to friends of mine that would say, wow, Goodfellas is the most expensive restaurant in, in the Twin Cities. When it opened in 87, and got all these awards and was just a fabulous restaurant. I, I feel a little uncomfortable about them. I'm from central Wisconsin. I don't know fine dining. I was just learning what was going on. <clears throat> but then I realized that, you know, no, that's something to be proud of. You know, not if you overprice something, but the price is directly re relevant to what the value is. And if you deliver the value in more than what, the, the higher value than what someone's even expecting, uh, you're going to be okay in the long run. And so with the bakery, you know, we're not out to be the cheapest bakery. We're not out there to make the least expensive products. We're out there now with our growth. What's really exciting to me is that with our volume growth, we now have more and more opportunity to make the same and better quality product actually being able to offer it out at a lesser price because of the production. I mean, if you're making 10,000 uh, dinner rolls an hour on a machine versus you were making 1,000 by hand before, well, the price point starts to change just in that. If you're buying flour by the silo full rather than, you know, 50-pound bags, uh, people have to move it in, empty it out, get rid of the bag, take it out, garbage to get it back in again. Um, you start to develop some other efficiencies. And that's what's exciting to me at this point in the, in the growth of Franklin Street Bakery is that now we're starting to see that we can continue to make even better quality products and be even more competitive on the price as well. But there are, there are flashpoints along the way that in any business you know, you're going to encounter and you've got to kind of figure it out. Um, and from the standpoint of Franklin Street Bakery, you know, outgrowing your space within three years um, is kind of a scary thing, but it's also a pretty exciting thing to say, okay, now, now what do we do? What if we actually do the next step? Right, and that's where we're at. Retail. I'm going, I want to finish the thought on retail. Is that, you know, we we would we're open to building the retail uh, business. We've got 
probably a dozen sites. I mean, every other week there's somebody that calls and says, I've got 800 square feet or I've got 1,000 square feet of Franklin Street Bakery you know, spot would look great here in, in one of the suburban areas. And they're right, it would. Uh, and we probably do very well. And because we are making all our own stuff, you could just go around and deliver it to ourselves and you could still offer it at a very competitive price. And it would be a better product than anybody else out there, frankly. But what we're trying to be careful about, and if we do this right, then we were smart and careful. Careful if we, if we don't do it right and kind of trip, our, trip on our own toes, uh, maybe we aren't that smart. Um, we don't think we sh should, and we're not, going after the same growth, retail and wholesale. Wholesale is more important to us at this point. Uh, and you don't want to split your resources too thin, whether it's capital, whether it's uh, labor, whether it's qualified people to manage those units. Each time you open a unit, you're going to have to get a management and staff that is going to be representative of you know, that product, whether it's in Maple Grove or in Eden Prairie or where have you. As opposed to, if you're focusing on your wholesale production and getting that right at this point, if you have to choose one or the other, we <coughs> have chosen at this point to do wholesale. Um, we don't have a bucket of money sitting around to where we can you know, roll these things out to those locations at this point necessarily, <coughs> but even if we did, I will tell you, because we've talked about it, um, we, we probably wouldn't at this time because it's not part of our key strategic growth plan to get that retail up to a particular point. Uh, the marketing side of that would be really great because, like I said, retail is the sexy side of it. Then more people might be aware of the Franklin Street Bakery and they'd, they'd see all these neat products. But really, again, we've stepped back and looked at it and said, so what would that do for us if we're trying to do a national expansion? Let's say we had a bunch of units here and everybody was wild about Franklin Street Bakery. Well, it still doesn't mean anything in Seattle or in Dallas or in San Diego or what have you uh, because you don't have stores there. So we don't want to chase the stores to develop the wholesale brand. We'd rather be the best wholesale bakery in the country, and that's what we're working to do. Um, I open it up to questions. I have one question for you, though. Um, if you, right now, if you're going into a business, I, I, I assume the answer on this, but maybe it's not that obvious. So you now have an opportunity to open a bakery. Or uh, let, me, let me rephrase it. You have an opportunity to get into the bakery business. And I'm the executive vice president of you know, Buns R Us International. <laughs> and I've got an executive position available for you to join my mega company. And we're doing you know, $5 billion a year in business. <clears throat> or I'm Wayne Kostrowski, and this is a few years back, and I want to get a bakery going. I've, I've made some products. I think we can do this. But you know, why don't you come on in and let's, you know, don't know where this is going to go. And I'm going to, you know, we'll pay you pretty well, but you get more money if you go to Buns or Us than you would to come with this company. Which one would you prefer to choose at this time in your life? What, what do you think would be better for you, either financially, personally, or both? How many would go with Buns or Us? God, I love that answer. This is, this is the right class. Now, why? My question is, why would you prefer to do that? Go ahead. I prefer the challenge of nurturing something. Okay. As, as that other position, you're just stepping into something that's already existing and all you got to do is manage. But what if you could make five times the money that you... Money's not there. Okay, go ahead. Um, I was just going to say, you know, with you, because I don't know anything about the business, I'd rather start from the beginning and learn on the way. Go ahead. Jeff talked one day about taking control. <laughs> And that, that really like hit me. So like if you could actually start in a newer business, you can take control and feel like you're really in control of things, whereas you might just feel like you're one of the pawns if you're on like a large corporate scale. Somebody else over here. Any other, why? Anybody else? Why you do that? You prefer to do the? Go ahead. Oh, I would definitely say that at this point in our life, it's more about getting a learning opportunity than it is about <coughs> making a lot of money and the financial aspect of it. So that's what's more important to me. I think you'd learn a lot more in a smaller business that's growing. Good. Go ahead. You're from Central Wisconsin. <laughs> 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 nice jersey. Yeah, thank you. How'd that turn out Sunday? Was that? Oh, yeah, 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 I think you came up lucky. You came up on the good end. <laughs> Anybody else? Why? Okay. Go ahead. <laughs> Good point. 
Well, I, now, one thing I'd like, just because I like to stir things up, you know, look at the other side of it, though, as well. I mean, very good points about the age at which you're at right now. You need to learn more. You'd like to, you know, learn more about, uh, you know, the industry and hone your skills, et cetera. <clears throat> There's nothing fundamentally wrong with being with a very large company. And to me, this is just a personal thing, just because I get to stand up and, and talk, uh, large, large corporations are not bad. And unfortunately, I think there's, there's, a, uh, there's a feeling amongst some in this country that they look at businesses that are large to be bad. Well, there's plenty of bad big businesses with bad principles and bad character and everything else. But there also are plenty of large good companies who have their, uh, their, their character in place, their integrity in place, and they do things the right way. Plus, from the standpoint of people getting the opportunity at some point to go in, if they're given the flexibility to use their ideas and to, uh, uh, to, to develop their skills, that's okay as well. And the advantage of that, in many cases, if it's done right, is there's a larger arsenal of resources around them, you know, different departments and smarter people around them you can turn to as opposed to it's just two or three of us or five of us starting a business. I don't say that to change your mind on this, but I do... Um, kind of want to encourage you and caution you that you know I'm I'm uncomfortable with some sentiment out there in some circles that say you know well big business is bad because look what's happened and that's why I want to come full circle around to what you know you mentioned about my management style what I believe is whether the company is puny and growing to be just above puny but they're happy about it and that's what their goals are that's fine if you aspire to be the CEO of a you know, Buns R Us, $5 million company, that's okay too. And when, you know, if you go there along the right way with the right principles and the right integrity, fabulous. There's no one way to do it. But I think the most important thing, you guys are at a great time in your life to kind of begin to sort that through and say, you know, here's what I think I want today. And it's okay to change it, you know, tomorrow or a year from now or five years from now. You don't have to be locked and loaded in what you think today. But if you keep the one core principle in place is who are you, what's important to you, and you know, who do you want to surround yourself with to get to be a, to, to be a success. If you keep that intact, there are a lot, lots of roads available to you. But to me, you know, the scary, the uncomfortable, the challenging entrepreneur world is, I mean, I wouldn't trade it. I, I, I say many times I would have failed the corporate world if I, if I was in the corporate world from the very beginning. And I don't, I don't think I'd handle it very well because I think I'd speak up too quickly and, you know, throw my ideas around too quickly. But in some environments, that worked. But I, I wouldn't trade what the, the route was to this this point for me uh, for anything. So I, I encourage you all to, you know, keep poking around, but make sure you keep your principles in place. And there's one, there's a phrase that someone once told me, and I tell it to my kids and everybody else: be an individual who brings out the best in those around you. Be an individual who brings out the best in those around you. If you do that, chances are you're going to be very successful. That's hiring the best people, et cetera, all that stuff. But really, if anybody you get in, whether you're working with one other person or 20 other people, uh, if you can be the one that brings out talent that somebody else didn't have, why do you think they're the most valuable players on sports teams? They may be the best shooter, they may be the best at that particular position, but really, the really valuable people are the ones who have, kind of draw out talent that other people didn't even know they had. It's no different in the business world, it's no different in being an entrepreneur. It's really trying to find ways that you can, you can become smarter yourself, but also have other people become smarter around you because you give them the opportunity. Questions? Go ahead. Um. About changing on the fly, like when you were out there in the care booth, did you have to like build an all new clientele or did you just start distributing to clientele that you already have? That's a very good question. Uh, it, it, it's a little of everything. Uh, the situation condensed with Caribou was there was a contract in place for a certain amount of business for a certain period of time. A new COO came in and basically, you know, I, I, I called a meeting and sat down and said, gosh, you're, you're valued customer of ours, like to get to know you, what can we do to help you, it's a great relationship, we love what we're doing with you. And basically all he was interested in was saying, we gotta get 
you know, got to pay less, got to do this, got to do this. And I said, well, okay, well, you know, we'll see what we can do. And literally, he said, I want you to math, match the prices that we're getting from our bakery in Chicago. And I said, well, uh, first of all, we don't need to do that. We got the contract. We, nothing in there says we have to change price or whatever. But we'll go down and we'll check out the product. So we went down and checked out the product and found out that it, was, it wasn't very good. I mean, it was box mix and it was, yeah, no wonder it was less expensive. So came back and said, we can't change, we're not going to change the price at what we got right now, but we'll build some incentives in so you can save literally $100,000 plus over the course of the last part of the contract. And didn't want to do that and said he could terminate the contract for what was called lack of communication. We were communicating just fine, we just weren't agreed. Um, so uh, um, during the time we realized that a couple, I mean, a couple very important things. For one thing, we had too much business in one company. I mean, for a, a successful business, is you're selling something, you want to have it spread out. You don't want to have 70%. And we were just all excited about this growth and went from two stores to 45 and Yahoo and isn't this great? Um, but we had, we, we really were coming, it was a pretty scary time. We were coming, we were, during the time that this whole legal thing went out and no one thought, certainly we didn't think it was going to go to a jury trial on a contract dispute. But it went there and all, all attorneys were delighted because they kept you know, ringing, up the, <laughs> ringing up the hours. But, you know, when, it, when you're in the courtroom, I'd never been in the courtroom in my life and I, I was the lead guy and, you know, sitting there going and looking at jurors and going, my gosh, now TV doesn't do this justice. I don't know what they're thinking. I mean, they may think these guys are right that they could have done this. So we were co concurrent to that whole process, about a 14-month process. Uh, we were looking at it and saying, okay, is this really the business we should be doing? Should we be in this fresh delivery, fresh baked, whatever? And where can we go with it? Let's say everything turns out fine. Is this what we really should continue to do? Buying more trucks, getting more drivers, moving it around. And again, kind of looking ahead five years to where, you know, what, what would make the company more successful, did that really fit with what we could do or we wanted to do? And we kind of said, no, we, we can, we'll be limited as to what we can do in this market because you can't also sell your fresh product. If you're making it here, you can't sell it in Wisconsin. You know, uh, you can't deliver it to there every single day because with that, and that wasn't the model we were heading to. So we had to make a conscious decision and say, well, what either, you know, if we continue, what would we do? And Mark Haugen is really the brains behind this thing. He's the chef and he's the food guy. And he started ta seeing the trend of where, you know, people love fresh bread. I mean, there's very few things that beat fresh bread. But this is fresh bread. It's frozen when, once it's done and it, the properties do not break down at all until you either let it thaw out in 10 minutes or you heat it up. So it's a better product, but it would require different capital and different equipment and everything else. And so we really couldn't, we couldn't make a decision to, to take the next step on either of those two routes until we found out what happened with this, this uh, lawsuit. And had we lost the lawsuit, I'd, I'd probably be part of a charity today. I mean, it, was, it, was, it could have brought all the house of cards down. Fortunately, though, they... I know you're recording this. They got spanked. It was really, it, 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 was, it was dumb all along, but un, unfortunately, many times when something looks that obvious, you know, you don't know what's going to happen, particularly if you've handed it over to, you know, seven people that may or may not know the business or whatever, and you're just sitting there. But they came back, and it was good. But it got us back to ground zero, and we said, okay, this is the route we're going to go. So it was, a, it was a, a time at which, frankly, and I don't know how goofy this is going to sound. Only looking back, but not at the time. I'm really glad it happened because it kind of smacked us on the side of the head and said, okay, should we keep, if we weren't challenged with what we were doing, we probably would have continued to do the fresh bread route, the fresh delivery, and the fresh muffins, and all that kind of stuff, and be limited from what we could grow. So this scary situation um, woke us up and said, well, you know, a, are we doing the right thing? And if it comes out, should we keep doing the right thing? No. And so we were fortunate on that. Brett Favre plays better when he gets whacked on the side of the head. So <laughs> that's, that's, I'm glad they got hit on something. Go ahead. Um, question regarding growth. You outgrew this current facility in three years? Or in just, you know, We, we are. Well, we moved in the old facility, 7,000 square feet in 94. <clears throat> Built this place in 2003 because we 
woefully out for the other place. Yeah. Now it's 20,000 square feet and we're in our third year and we just, uh, we're, we're heading there. In regarding to expanding again, whether you're just expanding onto the building or you move to a completely separate location and grow, do you have any concerns about over expanding? Do you foresee all the demand or demand growing <coughs> for your facilities? I absolutely wonder about over expanding every single day. Uh, every time we buy another piece of equipment, uh, the ROI, the return on investment on a piece of equipment um, uh, is, is one of the things where, you know, that's a fast learning curve. You know, if you're going to buy a machine that makes 10,000 pieces an hour, well, you buy the machine before you have the business for the 10,000 because you can't keep up with it anyway. But then you buy the machine, let's say, making this up, it, when you're making 5,000 pieces a day right now the way you are, you put the machine in, in order to pay for that thing, you've got to get that other 5000 as quickly as you can to start returning you know, the dollars on that particular investment. So we, we tend to be pretty conservative. I mean, we're, we're pretty ambitious guys, but we're pretty conservative about what we do with our investment and how we're going to grow. And I think one of the things that Mark and I talk about a lot is um, we basically say the only way we're going to mess this up is if we mess it up. And that's why we think through things kind of two or three times before we actually say, okay, let's take this next step. Because you can get pretty enamored. Success is a, you know, spurts of success. You're not always successful every single day. You kind of go up and down. Things are going well and things aren't going well, but you get out of that valley to get back to the next success level. Uh, success can be a, a, a pretty distracting thing. You can say, wow, man, we're pretty good. Look at all these blurs. We're now in 14 states. You know, three years ago, we were in four. We must be pretty good. Sure, we can keep buying this stuff. Yeah, we can, you know, 40,000 square foot facility? Hell, let's get a 100,000 square foot facility because look at what we're doing. Uh, so uh, being realistic, you know, you got to be ambitious, but you, you, you always have to have the reality check a couple of times through. And another good piece of advice I would say is that make sure you get a reality check from someone outside of your inner business circle ask for opinions of someone else. It, even if they don't know bakery, um, you know, I ask people that I trust, uh, you know, that are in the business world, you ask them for opinions. And they, you know, they, they may know nothing about your business, but they may, you know, latch on or nail you with one or two good nuggets of general good business growth principles or something where you go, I never thought of that. You know, that's a very good question. Go ahead. Um, as far as, uh, I, I know it's not really a question, but <clears throat> could you talk about your involvement with the case of the NFL and uh, hunger issues? Let me, let me come back to that because I always have the advertisement for that. I love that. That's, I just came back this morning, as a matter of fact, from a planning Super Bowl 2008 in Phoenix, if you can believe it. We're already working on that. Other bakery stuff for right now, though. Go ahead. With the management team, uh, the three of you, where do you guys put most of your focus on between like Bar Abilene and Tejas? Like, are you mainly the baker guy, or is everybody everybody? Uh, everybody's. <coughs> right, Mark and I, we, our, our, Mark and I own the bakery solely, just the two of us. The rest of the entities are with the three of us, John and and John lives in Dallas, and he's he's not active day to day uh, partner, really. Uh, very bright guy, and we rely on him, but he lives in Dallas, and he's got other businesses. Um, we, we kind of split it up. Um, it really depends on you know, what, what's going on. For example, gearing up for Bar Alley for the summertime. We'll put more effort into that in, in April and May, gearing up for a busier season. A little bit more time will shift over to Bar Alley. Uh, Taos will shift at different times as well. The bakery, though, I would say, which I appreciate your question, is probably most consistently the highest focus of our time has been and will be because it's the, the, the highest growth opportunity. Um, if we bring another 100 people into Teos every day and 100 people into, into uh, Bar Abilene every day, uh, that's going to affect the bottom line. That's going to you know, be, be, make us a little bit more successful, et cetera. Uh, but really, which we are thinking about, uh, expanding Bar Abilene. But really, if, unless we focus on expanding Bar Abilene to another location or a couple locations, um, the return on that time isn't uh, as important as it is right now with the growth vehicle, what, what we're experiencing with Franklin Street Bakery. I, I always like to say, I mean, this is a dorky example, but 
the management teams will tell you that I'm a dork when I bring this up and I keep bringing it up. If, if you don't have your lug nuts on tightly, you know, when you're going 50 miles an hour, you're going to have real problems when you're going 70 miles an hour because it's a whole different set of disaster that can hit. My point is, is that you gotta, you got to keep an eye on, on the most important stuff at the foundation level. Now, there's not a whole lot of extra work that needs to be worked on the foundation of the restaurants at this point. If we open another restaurant, there's a ton of stuff. The bakery, though, because it's in its growth spurt the way it is, uh, we got to make sure those lug nuts are on there correctly now because when we go from 5,000 to 10,000 pieces and we go from 14 states to 20 states and all this kind of stuff, that's not the time you start going back and saying, well, you know, we should probably check the sturdiness of that box that we're shipping because it always comes in like that. Well, you might have checked that a while back first. So the timing on that is very, very important. But we spend most of our time really right now with the, the bakery. How far out are you distributing bakery products? Like as for Paul Rouge, you have sitting and all this business in Grand City and St. Cloud. Like we're in every, the, the dinner rolls, don't order a burger at this point. Order the whatever meal comes with the little dinner rolls at Culver's. And then tell them, man. This is the best dinner roll I've ever had in my life. <laughs> um, we, that's one product. We're looking into the different products. Frankly, it's, it, again, part of the growth with Culver's is if they said tomorrow we want you to do all our hamburger buns, uh, we couldn't do it. I mean, it would take a while to do it. We'd find a way. We'd have to get a tunnel oven. We'd have to definitely get another you know, facility. But that's where we're going with this. We're developing the trust with them that we want to do you know, all their products, you know, their, their key product as well. But you know, it takes time to get there. Um, so they, we're in all their units. As far as you know, states-wise, um, I, I was in Phoenix yesterday, and um, long story short, we could get our products into a number of places down there. I was working on the Taste of the NFL stuff down there. But we were already getting requests. They heard that we have this bakery. We heard it was a great bakery. Someone had worked back in this area. They were in the hotel business, and they got transferred out there, and they said, we have do great guns with the Franklins. Can you get the product out here? Well, again, it's kind of sounding really cool. We're, yeah, you want it? Sure, we can get it out here. No problem. Well, no, you got to work out the shipping. you got to find out if it's through the Cisco system or U.S. Food Service or whatever. We spread out right now kind of to Nebraska, to um, southern Illinois, to Ohio and Michigan primarily. But we're pretty close to Cisco. They're, they're a national distributor. Um, in the next three, four months, we'll find out if they pick up a couple of our products system-wide nationally. And fortunately... They're in the business of distribution. All we need to do is get the product to a couple central locations. We'll do it that way. But we got to be, you know, we got to, we have to be careful that we just don't, you know, grab everything and say yes, 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 and then not be able to deliver. With all the new machines, I, I was reading the paper and it said that you had kept like all of your employees from the previous location of the new bakery location. It kind of sounds like this whole silo flour robot can take care of producing this bread by itself. Mm -hmm. So what? Do you worry that you're going to end up losing people if you continue to expand? Or I, I, I love the fact that you asked that question because that, again, going back to big business versus you know smaller business and building business. Um, we look at adding at equipment as not having to hire more people, and we look at it as when this when the silo comes in and this it's called the roll line and when the new mixers have come in. It's, it's more automated. We look at it as, as saying, we have now the opportunity to, uh, and 85% and, uh, of our staff is minority. Of, of all, we look like the United Nations, right? I mean, when you walk through, the, every nationality is represented. <laughs> and we teach English classes free to an employee and to a member of the family or a roommate, whatever, and they go through it. And if they pass, each time they pass a six or eight week course on it, held in our place twice a week, they get an extra 50 bucks as well. I mean, we're encouraging them to learn English so that they can acclimate themselves to you know, even better community life as well. I'm most excited about the growth from the standpoint of equipment and everything else is that we can get more efficiencies, get better return on our dollar, and give the people that have been working for us, the current staff of 100, more money because they're learning more skills. They're learning how to, you know, they're learning more than just taking a bag off a truck and dumping it in. Now they're learning how to, you know, program it into machines and everything else. That's from a labor standpoint, you know, what's most exciting to us. We don't, we don't intend, even though our business 
you know, has doubled in the last three years. We haven't really doubled our workforce per se, and really if it doubles again, we don't really need to add that many more people. And so from a jobs creation standpoint, we're probably, you know, less of a model than we were three years ago. But from a uh, quality of life and employee uh, opportunity uh, growth standpoint, we're huge. Because if someone leaves our place, uh, they're going to they're gonna be sharper, they're going to be a little smarter, they're going to be more skilled, and they're probably going to have a better grasp <coughs> of their community and the language. So I, I love the fact that you asked that question because it's not, we're not replacing people with the machines. We're, we're trying to get more machines in that we are able to better enhance the quality of life of the people we've got. Because then they, they're great and they continue to be great. The distributors, uh, even knowing that the salespeople from the you know, Cisco's that come into the restaurant say, you know, you know, I can, I can sell you that for a little bit cheaper than what they got down the street. Well, they're, they're sales guys. I mean, nothing against it, but they're, they got a sell sheet of this. Oh, you're looking for a pen? I can sell you that pen. Right. They're not going in and proactively saying, I got this great product. It's frankly, you can't count on all of them to do that. So you, we now are starting to learn and hire. We just hired a broker in Indiana, and we're interviewing some brokers in Ohio. And so what they do then is they take their territory and they work through Cisco or U.S. Food Service or Northern Hasserot or somebody in that area that does a lot of business, and they're the ones that kind of work your product into their line. But the first question was, who are your competitors? Yeah. Um, Do those same brokers represent your competitors? Here and there. Uh, we, we like to try to find a way to nudge a few out here and there. But at the same time, I, don't, I, also, I personally don't really have a problem with someone selling the two products and putting them down in front of a, a <laughs> restaurateur or a hotelier and saying there are the two products because we'll kick them. I mean, it's just, you know, it, it, it's good. Our, our competitors are, uh, the other, nationally is uh, Nancy Silverton, has uh, La Brea Bakery. We've seen that in some grocery stores and everything else. Wonderful product, great lady. Uh, I hope she continues to be, you know, 100 times more successful than we are, which she is, God bless her. But she started with a restaurant in Los Angeles and met her 25 years ago. And she's, she's a great baker, great bread person. Um, nationally, there's, the competitors are kind of the, the, the usual frozen dough people. And that's why we're kind of starting to clean up a little bit, is that people are realizing that you can get a better product for a you know, very competitive price. And bread, you know, going way back to Caribou and Starbucks and everybody else, I mean, who would have thought that you'd pay that much for a cup of coffee? And people would say, well, no, they're... Know, you'll never be doing that. Well, we really do believe that bread is <coughs> similar. People will not give up certain things in quality. I mean, they'll not buy a number of things, but in the column of, you know, some certain staples that are important to them, coffee, it's very important to some people. Bread is really important to people, whether it's on a sandwich or with a roll or grilling or whatever. And so we think we're in the right category of being competitive and putting a good product out there. The, 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 hurdle that we face most is having it are the fresh delivered the new French bakery and some other people who are still doing the fresh bakery stuff who have no interest of expanding beyond all this area and having people understand the quality of the product you know matches up and in some cases ours, ours is better that mentality is is kind of our competitor because if you say it's an easy shutdown if you say well I'll tell you what I'll, I'll, I'll bring you some bread you want it frozen or fresh well duh I'll take the fresh. But really, our product, you know, getting that mindset mindset shifted over is, is, is the biggest thing that we're working with right now. And we're getting there. It's going to take a little more time. The paper uh, talked to Wendy in your entrepreneurial background about being a bass player. Dude! <laughs> yeah. Where, where, uh, where did the band start and who uh, did you tour with? <laughs> um, in my youth, uh, I went to the University of moved down to, uh, to go to the University of Madison in the middle of the early 70s when, man, those are great times. <laughs> when I can remember, I guess. But it was, uh, you know, in the time when there was a great music around, it was a protest of the war, Madison was a hotbed, it was basically the Midwestern Berkeley. Um, yeah, my hair was down to here. Yeah, we played in a pretty popular band in Madison. Um, and it, it, was, it was a great time. Um, and we played with a lot of people that, God, none of you here know, but you know, BB well, King. I went to in the right, there you go. So we probably played there. Uh, you know, Claire, yeah. the bar, 
place called the Bar. We used to come through and play there. Yeah. Excuse us just a second. So the, uh, <laughs> um, but we toured all over the country. We played with like BB King and Sticks and Firefall and John Sebastian and a whole bunch of people. And then we recorded an album in '73, and I, I think you best put it in the introduction when you first started talking about it. You know, I realized I was, you know, I was not. I loved it, I, and we just had a reunion a year ago. Uh, we, 30 years later, we played at the Dakota. It was a bunch of old geezers on stage having a great time. We sold the place out. The band was called Circus, and we would play up here all the time. But, um, you know, I, I, I realized that we, we'd been together a long time, and I realized that that really wasn't going to be, you know, a business that I could, you know, I wasn't good enough. You know, I, I think I am now, but geez, I should have been. <laughs> but it was a lot of fun. Thanks for asking, dude. It seems like you put a lot of time and energy into the bakery, and the, maybe the restaurants aren't getting a lot of attention. Have you thought about selling those off? And if you have, have you thought about, you, you mentioned that retail space would be a, a good opportunity for the Franklin Street Bakery. Maybe like think about like, um, franchising that? Mm -hmm. um, franchise, starting with the end one. Franchising uh, confuses me completely. I, I, there are so many pieces to franchising. I mean, you probably know better than, I know you know better than I do, but the whole concept of franchising. There, you got to have a lot of things lined up, and it, there's a lot of legal stuff, etc. And I'm not a very good legal guy. Uh, I'm really getting lazy when when you get into some of those details. I, I it's, it's a flaw. I'm not proud of it. I just kind of go, I don't want to get. Ah, geez, dude, we have to really figure that out. Uh, but franchising is a is a is a very lucrative business when you hit it right. It's it's huge, uh, and I know a lot of people who have done very well with franchising. Um, my former partners, it wasn't a franchise, but my former partners were the founders of Buca. When I left Filio, they started Buca. Now they got Ocean Air. They're, they're, it's chains. It's not some are franchise, some are not. Um, it's a wonderful business to get in if that's what y you like to do is to grow that, that side of it. Um, but I, I, don't, I don't know that we would do that. I, I'm, still, I'm still toying, quite frankly, announced first here today. I mean, I'm still wondering if we shouldn't separate out the name of the retail side and the name of the wholesale side and maybe separate them out into separate LLCs so that we would better have that opportunity mm -hmm. down the line. Um, because then, uh, if, if I wanted to be uh, you know, really rich at some day and someone said, well, look, we'll just buy the retail side. You're not affecting your wholesale side. So, <laughs> yeah, go ahead. That's fine. You know, just pay for my college kids stuff now and we'll be fine. <laughs> um, but I think um, the retail thing isn't off the, off off our radar screen. It's just I think the timing right now is, is important. Uh, the restaurants, um, they're, they're profitable restaurants. I mean, if someone, if you guys added up the money and got the right price, I'd probably sell them to you today. But it, you know, as long as it's a profitable business, and I, I, my wife asked me that actually about a year ago. She said, what if you just, what if you just doing the bakery thing, aren't you, you know, and you, and you weren't involved with the restaurants or got rid of the restaurants or whatever, it would, you know, would that be okay? And I said, I don't think I would really it would take me a while because I've been in the restaurant business this long. And the best part about the restaurant for me is, is walking around and talking to people, finding out you know, how they're having a good time. And, and actually, it's the same thing as rock and roll, <laughs> kind of. <laughs> people ask me about the transition from being in music to hospitality. And I didn't know at the time, but looking back, it's a no-brainer. You work when everybody else isn't working. You're working nights and weekends. You're getting a response from people. You know, when you finish a song, people either clap or throw stuff at you. When you serve a plate to someone and you say, how do you like it? You're getting a response. It's not going to committee. It's not go they're saying, this is great fish or you know, smells my like my socks. I mean, they tell you right then and there. Plus, your people are giving you, willingly giving you their time and their wallet to either listen to your songs or you know, give them a memorable experience. And in the restaurants, we, we always say, you know, it's not, it's about food, it's about all that stuff, but really, any training session you have in our restaurants, we'll say, your, your goal is to make someone feel better when they leave than when they came in. And because you're dealing with memories, you might have one table that's getting divorced, another table that's on a first date, another one that's, you know, thinking about how noisy that other kid over there and they're changing their mind about having kids. You might have happy people over here. You might, have, you know, you don't know. In a, in a restaurant, full restaurant, you got. That's what's so exciting about it. Is you've got all of, all of mankind in front of you, and you can kind of choose to find out, you know, how you can make their experience better, and then they leave. Because in the restaurant, they give you they give you their watch and they give you their wallet. 
and then they sit down. It's not like you're going to buy shirts or whatever you kind of, maybe I'll buy that, I'm thinking of that, I'm looking that over. No, you're already in. You sat down and they're saying, you got me. Now, just give me value. And so that interaction to me is, I, I, I don't know, I, I miss that. I mean, I don't, I'm not a golfer, I'm not, I mean, retirement means nothing to me. I, I, just, I just like that. And that's the energy I get from, uh, you know, the bakery gives me one kind of an energy, because you're building a business in a certain way, and the restaurant still is that direct touch. That's very exciting. And passing your bakery nearly every day, and I've seen this uh, building, it's really interesting. You have these huge windows, and you can look on the factory, and you talk a little bit about this whole philosophy behind this, the idea, what was the idea behind this? It, it was a deliberate, and if you were an investor in that, and we were putting it together, you'd say, no, close it up. Cinder blocks are cheaper than windows and energy and everything else. What? No. And by the way, it's a wholesale business. It's, it's a bread factory. Why would you put windows in there? Um, where that building sits was, there was a Super America station there at one time. And it was the highest 911 violent crimes location in the city. Five years running. So we were able to you know, get, get the land to put it in there. And the reason we went there is that the old bakery was just seven blocks away and we didn't want to lose our workforce. And somewhere along the line, Mark and I looked at each other and said, we could be a part of this community if this place is lit and active 24-7. You know, and we were convinced that was a good thing to do and that it would be good for the neighborhood and it would you know, be a better value to everybody around there. What we didn't realize what a huge asset it was for the employees. The employees now are working and having people watch them. It's almost, it's not the Guthrie, but close. <laughs> they're watching you do your craft. You know, you're, they're pouring the stuff in, they're working around, they're moving stuff around. And it's, it's so cool to watch because they'll look up and someone outside will be waving at them and they'll wave back. <laughs> Plus there's sunlight coming in. Plus, you know, we never, never counted on or realized what, a, what an impact that was on the employees. And seldom a day goes by that someone, we don't see something <coughs> happening, the interaction between the two that we go, wow, that was brilliant. You know, someone thought of that. <laughs> was that us? Wow, that's pretty cool. But we didn't know that aspect at all. But that's why we did it, is that we wanted to, the initial in, uh, intent was to uh, kind of open up the neighborhood and make it okay to walk around that area as opposed to wonder if some crime was going to happen. The extra bonus was these employees. My gosh, it's so cool. The, the, we spend more time cleaning the outside of the windows from fingerprints and nose prints. Honestly, ask our, ask our janitorial guy. He's always out there wiping that down because people are looking in. And, you know. <laughs> so it's a lot of fun. Wes, did you consider exploring the frozen dough market? Uh, we, we sell frozen dough uh, to Green Mill for their pizza in, in dough balls. And we've, we've thought about that, and we actually almost started pursuing that a little bit more aggressively a couple years ago, and frankly, the rest of the business got in the way. Um, the freezer capability is, is a problem to really consider doing more of that at this time. It's, it's not off the table, but you know, it, the, we're even looking at some uh, buildings right now where we said, look, we'll, we'll, we'll take an old warehouse. Mm. Most expensive is the insulation on the floor to make a freezer. If you want to turn a warehouse into a <coughs> freezer, it's, it's the floor insulation. Other than that, though, then you've got, you know, the compre you got a lot of money to put into a building. But, but we're, we're saying, you know, we now rent off-site because we have to. Well, we're thinking maybe the next building we get is a 20, 30, 40,000 foot building and we turn it into a freezer. Part of the driving thought of that is uh, if we don't need it, someone else needs it. The demand for freezer space is incredible. I mean, no matter what you're freezing, if you're freezing popsicles, I mean, you just... It's, it, the, it, there are not many places out there that you can uh, get your stuff into. So uh, the dough balls are not something we're looking at aggressively now, but we have looked at it, and you know, Green Mill is delighted about it, but we, we just, we'd, have to, we'd have to get another machine to keep up with somebody else. A couple other places said they wanted to do it. Uh, have you uh, created a lean culture to help your employees um, think more lean in order to manage growth? Lean meaning? Like a process improvement. We, we've gotten some great people in our organization. Uh, we've got some people who have come in and, you know, quality control, systems development. Um, you know, the associate general manager of the place uh, 
three years ago, was the president of the HR department of Frederick's Environ Law Firm. She came in and she did a project, a personnel project for a survey and stuff like that. We were so impressed with her work and we said, we need an HR person here. Um, you know, we're young, and we just moved into the place and we weren't doing the business volume we were now. And he said, we can't afford to hire you, but we want to hire you. And she said, no, thanks. I'm the president of, you know, of internal, of a law firm. And she was making some pretty good coins. And she said, you know, thanks, appreciate it, I like the culture here, the project was good, et cetera. She came back three weeks later and said, I've been thinking about this. This is a pretty cool place. So she, she developed then, over the next year, incredible HR systems for us and management training and staff training and all this other stuff that goes on in the different departments to the point where we said, you're better than an HR person, we're going to make you the associate general manager. Uh, and she's been doing a great job since then. My point of telling you all of that is, we look for really high quality people, whether they've got the skill set at the point that we need them now or not. If the potential is there, we want them because we don't want the competitor to get them, you know. And so developing a culture of, you know, how to continuous improvement, et cetera, we just got a financial guy in finally that we've been looking for this type of guy for a long time. In the restaurant business, this, this is a, an incredible learning curve for me. In the restaurant business, I know the restaurant business. I know how to look at a P&L sheet on a restaurant, you know, like that, and I can tell you, you know, what's working, what isn't, you know, what the food cost is at. You know, one food cost isn't right for every kind of restaurant, etc. All the numbers change, but I can look at that in 30 seconds and give you an analysis of that business. For the longest time, we've been trying to look at our bakery business with too much of a restaurant background mind financially on. on spreadsheets and everything else. We needed someone from the factory world, manufacturing world, to come in and say, you know, food cost is one thing, but, you know, uh, productivity for a man hour, productivity for this department, uh, what are you spending for this, for the return of this with this machine, uh, the steps, time and motion, et cetera, all that stuff that, you know, I only read about before and glazed over and napped in class, you know, but it's, <laughs> now it comes back and goes, geez, I wish I would, yeah, I get it now. But that's how we try to, you know, hone the, 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 uh, the, the management force and the labor force. And this training is all going on all the time. And we get it inspected nationally, we get you know, the highest marks possible, and we like that. You know, it's not just the local health inspector coming in, now it's going to be National American Institute of Baking that comes in and scores you on all sorts of you know, different points, where, you know, where you've got an on-off switch, where your eye wash, I mean, everything. And so we, we try to get people in that you know, can help us tune in on what, what's important to the workforce there. Do you provide your employees with uh, health or life insurance? We do. Uh, not, not life, but we, I mean, it's offered, but nobody takes it. Uh, we've got, um, <clears throat> I don't know how to put this correctly, and I, and I don't even know how, to, how I want to say it, but it, our workforce, um, it, it's offered to everybody. But um, at the Franklin Street Bakery, it's different even than it is at the restaurants of, of the benefits package. Uh, everybody talks about the benefits package. We have the benefits package. Many of the minorities that work where we're at, they're, they're legal, they're documented, all that kind of stuff. We pretty painstakingly cover that. But many of them are, uh, a good number of them, <coughs> are working here to send money back home. And so, um, they don't think like we do all the time. And, and that's, that's one of the other, I'm going to tangent for a second here. Our production manager is from Ecuador. He started with us, uh, uh, with Bakery, well, he's been with us about 10 years now. We've been around 12 years. He started as a mixer. And Elias Simbana is his name. And now he's, he's, he's the guy responsible for, you know, all the production of the bread and everything on the production floor. He's Ecuadorian. We started going through a couple of years ago when Joanne, the general manager I was telling you about, came in. And Mark and I do what we call coffee chats uh, once a year. And that's where we sit down for 15, 20 minutes, whatever it takes, with every single employee. And it's just the two of us and an interpreter if necessary. And we just, it's not a performance review. It's just where are you from? How's it going? How's the family? Uh, because the culture of the Hispanic countries is that, first of all, that you're the jefe and that you generally don't treat people all that well, whatever. And so coming to America, they're, you know, they're, they're concerned about that. Well, we try to make them feel more comfortable with that. But when it translates in, when you find out what's important to them, 
it, it is the wage. Uh, it is how do they get money back more comfortably. We brought in some bankers um, that spoke the different languages and said, you know, just to let them know, many of these people, and still do, get their paycheck and go down to the check cashing place <laughs> to get the money and have it wired to Ecuador or Venezuela or Mexico City or Cuenca or whatever. And we're trying to tell them to say, you know, look, you, you, you don't have to do that. I mean, open an account. And so we had three different banks. We had you know, large, medium, and local. And we've encouraged them to open an account and to let them know that if you take your paycheck that's cut on the Franklin Bank, it's just coincidence, by the way, but it's not our bank. Franklin Bank, and you go down and you cash it there, it doesn't cost you to cash your check. You can even just get the cash if it's cash. So we try to let them know some of the basics, but the mentality, you know, health insurance is important if they have kids or if they have a spouse, but many of these people come, have come over themselves and then their uncle comes over or their brother comes over or what have you. And it's all offered and, it, and it's pretty good packages, but they don't use it as much. Quick tangent onto the restaurant. Part of the problem with the restaurants and doing 401ks and everything else we found is that you guys are young and invincible <laughs> and, you know, you, you don't, servers don't, you know, they're gamblers. They're making the money and keeping the cash and reporting some <laughs> uh, and pocketing the rest. Uh, they, they, uh, it is true. I'll tell you what's really true is because ask any, any, any restaurant manager anywhere and they'll tell you that in their drawer, in their manager's desk is a stack of checks that have not been picked up by people either that still work there or have worked there Absolutely. because they don't work for their check. You know, it's minimum wage. And in Wisconsin, it's half minimum wage because of the tip credit. But, you know, it's, that's not what they're working for. They're working for the cash. And they're supposed to report 100% of that cash. But if they don't report at least 8% of that cash of, of their sales, 8% of their sales of that cash, then we, the, uh, the, uh, the management, the ownership, you know, God bless the IRS, has made us the stewards of why that's short. <laughs> and we can be fined for it. I love this country. <laughs> um, so, you know, it, it's a different mindset with health insurance and, and 401ks and everything else. Um, the staff, which makes up most of the, the numbers in a restaurant, are young and fresh and they're off to other things, etc. And they want to be covered if they're sick, but they don't always have families. Now, the, the ones that do have families, they take the insurance and, and we help support that a little bit. Um, I was just Sorry. wondering, with the fresh frozen bread, is that Basically, all that is is just freezing it when it comes out of the oven. Comes out, cools it. down, freezes it. Okay. Um, have you thought of repositioning that um, as different from fresh bread, as something better than fresh bread, rather than trying to compete with fresh bread? Yeah. Um, <laughs> we're, we're, it's a very good point. And if, if, if you have the best way to put that, um, you're on board. Come with me. Uh, but you're right. That's the route we need to go. However, the only difference is, I'm not sure that. I'm not sure that our best next push is around continuing to. Uh, someone once told me, "Where are you going to put your next dollar?" You know, someone says, "Well, we should advertise here and we should do this, or whatever." I always say, "Okay, you got one dollar. Where do you put that dollar first? You, you can't do it to five different places. Where do you put your first dollar? My first dollar. I don't know that it's best spent." trying to continue to push and convince people the diff I mean, that frozen is okay to fresh, I would rather convince the marketplace that already has accepted that fact that ours is better than the other products out there. Uh, if I get the second dollar, I'd go that route. Mm -hmm. But that, you know, that, that's kind of a, a balancing act for us, too, to figure out what we should do best next. Well, you talked about some of the early endeavors and what you're doing now, but what, is, uh, what are kind of some long-term goals you have yourself for bakery? Um, right now, you do 14 states. What are, I mean, let it shed some light on what's, what's really long term, 10, 20, 30 years out? Well, 30 years out, I hope I'm not doing this. Uh, yeah. I, the, it, it is really a, a, uh, the true plan for the bakery is to develop this to a, um, a projected level that we're, we think is a good level to have it be sold um, at some point. That's not in the next five years. It's probably not in the next ten years. But to position it in such a way that it, it becomes um, streamlined, simple, uh, easily picked up by some larger animal. Uh, on the way, though, uh, we do want to be national. 
because it sounds really good. But we don't know if we really, how far we should push the national. Uh, getting, uh, our pastries are phenomenal, by the way. Anything for Thanksgiving, make sure you go down and check out some of the stuff we've got coming out there. It's pretty nuts. The, the case that you walk into, right, when you walk in there, it looks like, you know, you got to pull up a chair and just look at it for a while. Um, but there's a problem, we were talking about products, there's a problem with what you grow with. You know, if we go from 14 states to 20 states, or we go from, you know, 6 million to 8 million to 12 million, it's really important what it is you're selling in that because of the profit margin on, on certain things. And um, the reason we want to reduce some of the products we're making is that we would rather make, we would rather sell more of less items because the efficiencies of the equipment and everything else, you know, merit that a lot better. Pastries get a little bit trickier uh, in that, you know, shipping paste, uh, cakes and everything else, you've got, to, you've got to put more money into the packaging. That's another surprise that I didn't realize, you know, I, I used to wonder why, um, you know, potato, every product, you got so little in a bag, it's really, this is my theory, it's really not that necessarily they're being cheap to give you this much chips in a bag that's this big. Packaging is outrageous. Packaging and transportation of a product is outrageous. Look at chapstick, for example. You know, do you really need that big package that, well, you do, because it's got to hang out from a marketing standpoint to be able to see it. If you just sold the tubes, they could sell it for a whole lot less because you don't have to package it, seal it, and other things. <coughs> My point is, is what, what we're, we're looking to grow with is we want to make sure we grow with the right product. And we're not in it for growth's sake. We're in it to say, how do we figure this out right? Um, we want to sell a, a gazillion hamburger buns before we sell another thousand pastry cakes. Great cash on cakes, better, better, you know, great cash return, but the margins on a uh, hamburger bun is much, much better. It's kind of like grocery stores have incredibly poor margins. I mean, they make one or two percent, but they rely on the volume. And so that's what you got to look at too when you're building a business. Tell us what um, As far as besides the bakery, uh, you said the bakery is the most exciting thing you've done. Do you have any further aspirations besides the bakery? Um, Business-wise, I'm not sure. I mean, I'll go back to the question uh, that was asked about Tasty NFL. Um, uh, if, if I had my druthers and I didn't have to work, I mean, I'll never retire. Uh, you have that on tape now, too. I'll never retire. I, 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 I can't sit around. Um, Tasty NFL is an event that's turned into a movement, that's turned into a cause, that's turned into a life-changing opportunity for lots of families. And basically, it's just an event at Super Bowl. Um, that we started here in 1992 when the Super Bowl was here. Uh, bringing a chef from each NFL city, pair them with a player, people walk around. That year was $75, now it's $600. It's the night before Super Bowl and all the money raised goes to hunger relief. We've raised over $6 million distributed. Um, and that's not a business. Um, if I had my way, I'd like to sell all my businesses and just do the growth of hunger relief. Um, and so that's my aspiration. Now, Going back to the partner piece again, I spend way too much time working on Taste of the NFL. We put them in other you know, cities. We do it with the Cowboys and the Bengals and whatever besides the National Super Bowl. And eventually we get to 32 cities where each of those, they raise their own money and they keep all the money. We don't even touch it. My partners, I'm, I'm blessed to have partners who have the same uh, philanthropic philosophy that I do. And that is that if you have an opportunity to give, give. If you can give time, do it. If you can give money, great. If you can offer some advice to a, an organization that needs some help that's doing some great work in the community, do it. Um, it's really, I think it's rare that you come across, you know, two other guys that totally believe the same thing. And so that's where, I mean, the next plateau of where I want to go, uh, if I don't have to worry about, you know, paying the bills, you know, on a day-to-day -day basis, well, that's where I'd like to be. And you know what? I'll be there. Someday I'll be there because that's where I'm going. Question of this one. Wayne, I've got one for you. Being Jeffrey in, Worth. Okay. Yes, thank you. Being in the food industry, you actually have a unique, rather, risk that you face. I think of the spinach scare that we just had with uh, people getting sick from spinach that have come out with the lawsuits. I remember back when General Mills had a fumigator who was using an unapproved fungicide on their wheat, similar to what you have wheat towers and it dramatically affected their sales. And, and with regards to that type of a threat, 
when you do that, it's interesting or you need to protect yourself from that type of a threat. And second of all, does it affect your risk profile on the structure of your business with the level of debt that you take on or, or whatever else in that? You could see a dramatic reduction in sales overnight of the long media that occurred. That, that's, <laughs> you, you know reality. Uh, that can happen any minute. I mean, what we do to, first of all, what we do to protect is that we, we're pretty stringent about, you know, these uh, inspections that come through. We're way out ahead of these inspections. We basically say, you know, if no one's coming in, we're still going to do it this way. We have metal detectors. We have um, recall process in place. There's any number of things that can mess you up. Um, and, it, and it can be in the, in, the, in the food supply chain, we're in there somewhere. We're not necessarily the beginning or the end. But we can either mess it up ourselves by using wrong sprays, wrong cleaners, wrong process, whatever. Or we could be uh, affected by someone else that we're buying stuff from, unbeknownst to us, passing it through, etc. Now, if something got totally recalled because someone else messed up, in, you know, in uh, not cleaning the truck out with the flour and found out that that was contaminated flour, or whatever, we didn't do a thing except load it in and, and use it. Um, that that could bring you to your knees easily, and that's the that's one of the things in the bakery industry that that wholesale side that really makes me nervous, truly makes me nervous. Because I, if, if I'm going to mess up, I want to, I want to mess up. I want my fingerprints on it. But worrying and wondering, worrying maybe too strong, but being concerned about what someone else may do to mess up our business, and it's out of your control, um, that's not a good, that's, that's uncomfortable. The restaurant business, the one thing I worry about is one person out of hundreds of employees not washing their hands one time. And, you know, from time to time, you get the lead story. Every few years, you get some restaurant that got closed down because, you know, there was contamination there. And it could have been the chef, and it could have been, you know, the busboy. It could have been the dishwasher. And so that's what, that's the fear side of the restaurant that I have is that, you know, that all ends like that. And a ton of spin, ton of PR, ton of whatever you want to try to do may or may not get you back out of that. But that's the one thing that can you know, stop your business cold is if you, if you don't take care of that aspect of it in the wholesale standpoint, understanding. And that's the partners. The other good part about the question is that that's why you choose your vendor partners very carefully, too. They can pop inspections on us, and we encourage them, and we can pop inspections on them. I mean, we'll go through the Cisco warehouse, or we'll go to a supplier, or we'll go to Lund Egg uh, in Wisconsin. We'll, you know, we'll go take a look every once in a while. You know, you, you, that doesn't necessarily, you know, prevent anything from happening, but it can. The one thing in the food industry, over, overwhelming to me, that I think is spiraling out of control, is this. Now, I'm, I love being provocative and maybe even creating some debate. Don't need to, but this whole obesity thing, um, it, it is a um, created, in my opinion, it is a, a well thought out, only getting started, even though it's been around 10 years in the making, uh, cr created crisis in this country to focus on the food industry. I'm not saying conspiracy, whatever, but it's not a conspiracy, but it, it is focused in that. Think back the first few times you heard of someone saying, well, you know, I think we might have an obesity problem. I think people are eating too fat. Well, yeah, there are, some, there are plenty of people, and you can roll out all sorts of statistics in anything. You can, you can find the statistics to support your position, whatever you want. You can always find, you know, some study somewhere that can, in anything you choose, any issue. But in this one, this thing has been on a roll for a long time. And the example of it is it started back from the success of tobacco, the success of alcohol, um, and now into obesity and saying, you know, uh, the food industry is responsible for being, th this is my problem, the food industry is responsible for people being overweight. I don't buy it. I mean, I think you are. <laughs> I mean, you, you, don't, you don't have to eat the stuff you have, whatever. Uh, but it's become this whole movement. And there are lots of people that are profiting nicely off that movement. I don't disagree that you know, there, you know, there's obesity and there's, you know, we should eat better and we should exercise more, et cetera. But it's heading toward, notice what happened with tobacco, which is a killer. 
And notice what's happening with alcohol. Now the uh, alcohol point level keeps sliding down a little bit more and saying, you know, rather than locking up yahoos that have three or more, ten or more you know, drunk driving things and throwing away the key, I think we should move the alcohol level down from 0.1 to 0.08 because then that will make everybody safer. Can you tell I don't agree with that? I think it's a bunch of poppycock. I mean, that's not going to do anything. That's, those aren't the problem people. It's the people that, you know, get back on the road after they're, they're schnauzed for, you know, being picked up for the tenth time. They should be gone. With the obesity thing, na uh, pointing as much focus and more and more, and you watch over the next few years. Remember today, standing here today, you watch a year from now, three years from now, five years from now, you watch where that whole issue of obesity goes to and how it more and more will point to someone. Right now it's the food service industry. And that's part of the problem is that when there's a problem with something, we, I think, as a society, tend to find someone to blame. And in business, you're going to run into that. You're going to run into all sorts of situations where you're going to scratch your head and you're going to go, well, why, why am I having such a problem to get this done or to do that, you know, to get this accomplished? Because that's what can happen if you let a groundswell go. So in the food industry, that's the one that worries me the most, is that, you know, you know, I, you should be using, you know, not uh, trans fats. You should be, I mean, you should be doing all that. But really, is that us to tell a company, you know, what to do? Now, McDonald's and all those guys are huge. Well, what if it was just, you know, Nick and Wayne's, you know, burger shop? Can't we choose to make it with whatever we want? If we want fat lard from a Wisconsin farm plunked into everything we make, um, my opinion is we should be able to do that. Now, maybe nobody will come and buy it, but should it be... Op, you know, governed from the outside saying, here's what you guys should do. And by the way, you're the ones that have all the money invested in this business, uh, but we're going to tell you what's right or what's not. There. Did I step off the soapbox now? <laughs> but that, that's what worries me, is the outside influence of some, some, some kind of groundswell that can happen. And now it happens to be obesity, something's next. Something will be next. And you've got to keep dodging the bullets.